Good morning. You know, it's the oddest thing. Pam is back today, and I noticed that noise in the congregation got a little stronger today, too. So, It's good to see all of you in God's house, whether you are here worshiping with us in the sanctuary, or if you're online watching us today on either our, fa- our church's Facebook page or on YouTube.com. We're glad that you're here. We're going to have a good time of fellowship and worship together. I do want to begin with, with, one, with one item of very, very good news. We, we have uh, four folks this morning who wish to join our church. So because we don't, uh, yes, because we don't, we don't have the invitation at the end as we used to have because of COVID restrictions, uh, I'm going to, uh, many of you have already uh, had an opportunity to meet uh, Ann Car- Cardell, Audrey, H- well, not, not so much, uh, Shirley Duncan and Audrey Hicks. They've been coming and worshiping with us. And uh, all three want to join along with uh, Shirley's, uh, with, I get this right, Shirley's husband, Warren. I had to look at the names again. Sorry, sorry about that, Shirley. But all three are moving their membership by transfer of letter from First Baptist Church, Lowell, North Carolina. So um, I'm, I'm going to ask if they will, please. Yes, all four are. Yes. So Ann and Shirley, will you stand up for just a minute? Let folks that may not have met you that see you. We are so thankful that you've made this decision. Uh, Audrey uh, has been a little under the weather the last few weeks, so she hasn't been here. And uh, Warren's tra- transferring his membership uh, by, by proxy. He wishes to be a part of this church family as well. So you've heard it presented to you. Do I hear a motion that we receive them into our church family? I see that hand. Thank you, Teresa. I see that other hand. Lois, thank you for the second. All those who are in favor, say aye. There can't be any, any uh, opposition to that. We are so thankful that you're a part of God's family. We've gotten to l- know and love you already, and we're looking forward to, to sharing many, many th- weeks and months and years ahead to come. God's going to pour out your blessings. We're going to try to be a church family to you, and we know that you're going to minister to us as well. Well, that's a wonderful way to start the worship hour. I also want to ha- make just a couple of announcements for you today. Uh, first of all, uh, we had a break-in last night in Helderman Hall. Uh, Mike, did you ever, did, beside the broken window, did you find anything amiss? Okay. You know, this is a problem that continues to plague churches throughout the United States. Uh, churches getting broken into. Uh, we have already installed alarm systems for this building, as well as the children's building, which also uh, has the office in the building. So um, we're going to continue to monitor the situation. Uh, we may make some changes yet. But uh, if, you s- if you're driving by at any time and you see anything suspicious, please call me or call Ben McCorkle or the police. If you think it deserves the police, just go ahead and call 911 so they can get here quickly. But uh, together we're going to do the very best we can to protect our, our buildings. Uh, of course, uh, they may be able to uh, break into our buildings, but they cannot attack the fellowship of Sunset Road Baptist Church, and for that I'm very thankful. A couple of updates on people that have been sick. Uh, Cheryl Roberts, uh, Hayward's sister-in-law, uh, earlier this week she was only given a few hours to live. Her, there was a huge buildup of carbon monoxide in her lungs, and the doctors had just given up all hope. But, you know, I, we, we sent out prayer, prayer requests. You started praying. God worked a miracle. The next morning she was sitting up in a bed eating breakfast, and she's been improving ever since. So we give God glory for all of that. Uh, Candy Kid is is uh, improving after having COVID, being hospitalized for COVID. She's doing better, but she's still extremely weak. Also, her dad, Marvin Cathy, has been hospitalized with COVID as well, so continue to pray for him. Also, uh, lift up uh, Glenda Saunders to you. Uh, this is Eva Warnstaff's daughter. Uh, she's going to start chemo and radiation treatments uh, very soon. Uh, Martha, I saw Wayne on Wednesday before he went to get his, to see about his, um, his, th- his, his checkup with his doctor. Has any, have you or anyone else heard from Wayne since? I'm, I should have called him, but I, I, I forgot to do so. Okay. We're going to, who has? Lois, you talked to him? Uh-huh. Very good. We'll continue to pray for Wayne. Thank you, Lois. 
I appreciate that update right there. Well, what, what, why don't we do that? Yes, Mike. And, and oh, she did die. I'm so sorry I didn't hear that update. When the last time I talked to your dad, uh, that was the situation. She crashed. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I make I may want to make that correction. Uh, Cheryl Roberts, uh, Hayward's sister-in-law, Mandy's aunt, did die this week after she had shown, shown some improvement, but then she she kind of crashed. She had some heart. She had I know COVID. She had COPD and she was ha struggling with COVID. So uh, we'll, we'll pray for your family. Thank you for updating, and, and I, I was not aware of that. And Mike, we'll pray for your, your uh, friends as well. Um, anyone else? You know, we're a family. We can do this, even if it's Sunday morning. Chuck. Okay. We will pray for, for Josh in our prayer. Josh Knight, uh, Chuck, son. yes, Carolyn. Vicki Hopkins, yes, I meant to mention Vicki. Uh, she has also uh, been sick, and so uh, we want to keep her in your prayer, our prayers as well. Teresa. Okay, let's pray. Okay, if you didn't hear, Marjorie Doby had her driver's license taken away, so uh, she won't be able to get around as, as well as she does. I know a lot of you are ministering to her, and I, I, you know, I call her and talk to her, and I know a lot of you do some things for her, and I'm just so appreciative of that. That's what a church family does. We care for one another. Anybody else? Okay, well, it is good to take that time and, and share with one another. And, you know, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Jason, if he will, when he, when he prays, just just. Lift up these folks. I know you're not going to remember all their names, but just pray for them if you will. And I'm going to ask Jason to come forward with our, with our call to worship. Well, good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is well today. We uh, got up this morning and saw that there was snow on the ground. Didn't I honestly didn't even think it was going to snow, so um, it was kind of a surprise, but um, anyway, it's always nice to get up and see the, although it was thin, like my hair, it was pretty to also like my hair, um, to see it out there. Yeah. Um, anyway, today's scripture, first Peter one, three through five says this, I, and I read this and, and I tell you, um, if, uh, it's, it's just three scriptures here, but man, there's so much packed into these. Um, it, it's amazing. Uh, so it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Again, we were dead, and now we're resurrected, resurrected uh, unto Jesus Christ the, for the living hope. Uh, and not only that, but to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed, in the last time, and that's sometimes I'll be honest. Often I forget um, is that when I when I became a, a Christian, when I accepted God's gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, yeah, I became an heir. So I became like Jesus in the fact that now I am a son of God, uh, and that I get to inherit the kingdom of God. Um, and sometimes I take that for granted. And so uh, when I read scripture like this, it just kind of recharges me. Um, it gets me um, excited. Is not the right word. That that seems to be uh, falling short. Uh, what I feel, and, and uh, but anyway, uh, I love the scripture, but uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you uh, for the inheritance that we uh, we received upon accepting your gift of salvation as, as only you can give. Uh, Lord, you, you alone are worthy of our salvation, or our, our worship. You alone are, are worthy um, of, of everything that we have to give back to you, uh, for it's all yours. Lord, I just... Um, I, I thank you for that. I thank you for the freedoms that we have to come together and worship you this morning. Uh, Lord, um, you, you've heard the request of our, of our family members here within the church. 
uh, Lord, you know each one of these uh, folks intimately um, as you do, and I just ask that uh, you would give peace where peace is needed. I ask that you give calming where calming is needed. I ask that you give reassurance and hope where those things are needed uh, to those throughout our, our church family. Um, Lord, we love you. May our worship be worthy this morning. Amen. morning uh just a quick update for those of you that are using that use the bible app um i've tried something a little different today by just linking the order of worship in the bible app so it'll come up as a step like as a document uh it does look a w little strange on mobile devices so i'm going to work on the formatting for that but i do find that easier than putting everything in order uh, but if you notice it and you have feedback to give me i can continue to work on how it's best presented in the bible app for the order of worship and the verses as well so thank you uh, that's that announcement. All right. Uh, now we're uh, going to continue uh, in a song of worship. shelter in the storm when troubles pour upon me for fears are rising like a flood my soul can rest securely oh Jesus I will hide you my place of peace and solace no trial is deep
Uh, if you haven't already noticed, Audrey is on vacation today, so uh, just pray for her. She and Dennis as they're gone this weekend. Um, you know, I, something happened to me a few moments ago. I didn't even realize what had been going on in my inside of me, and that was when we were sharing prayer concerns with one another. See, I try not to be conscious, conscious, excuse me, of the camera in the back, and I and I know that most of the people who are watching are, are church members. But, you know, I kept thinking, I guess in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, you know, somewhere someone might have stumbled onto our service. And we need to look like, I don't know, like Charles Stanley's church looks on when they, when they have worship. And, while, and as we were sharing that this morning, I realized, you know what? We're Sunset Road Baptist Church. If somebody from somewhere else wants to join us, we're glad you're with us. But you're getting the real us from now on, because this is what it's all about. So, on that note, I thought this morning we would do something that has been very a blessing to me in the past, and I hope it's been a blessing to you. And that is just ask you, if you have some words of praise, something God's been doing in your life that you just want to exalt Him this morning, or just, just a word that exalts God, you can do that right now. Anybody want to start? Don't be intimidated by the camera, please. Precious. God is precious to us. Any? If you couldn't hear, hear exactly what Mandy said, she was saying that uh, her mother had invited her over to come and spend the night with them because she had been feeling that she, she was a little down. And uh, she told her mother, told your mom, that uh, the comfort you needed didn't come, wouldn't come from her, but would come from God. And through reading her Bible, that God provided that comfort. Thank you, Mandy, for sharing that. Someone else. Pam said she just is praising God because so many people that she knows has, have already gotten the vaccine and, you know, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. There really is. We, we, we can look forward to the day when the ropes go away and the masks, well, they may be in there for a while, but the ropes go away and we can just get back to a, a, a normalcy that we haven't had for a long time. Anyone else? Yes, Teresa. God is good to us. Thank you, Teresa. Of course. Uh, Teresa was just saying that uh, she had retired recently. She, re she recognizes God's hand in all of this, that it was at exactly the right time, that she was, uh, would not have been able to do the work that she was doing from home. But now she's able to minister to people, and she just sees God working in her life and her family, and she just gives thanks to God for all of these things. Thank you, Teresa, for sharing. Anyone else? Okay, then come to the mic. Sorry. Um, it's been an incredibly tough week. <laughs> One of the hardest of my life. Um, if you had asked me in May or June, I'm not sure I would have told you I'd be here in February. 
um, it's hard. It's been really hard on all of us. Um, some things happened years ago that just surfaced. Um, I've dealt with those things. I have incredible family, uh, an incredible husband. <laughs> and everything has happened, like Mom said, just everything has happened right on time. Um, last week when Jason shared about losing his job, um, wow, that was a huge shock to me. Um, but it was never a surprise to God. None of this has ever been a surprise to him. Um, the way that all that worked out, the way that we have been so richly blessed, um, it's just incredible. And my biggest thanks is to Steve for being a constant source of encouragement. Um, I told him the other week, I never thought a tall, white, old man would be like my one of Wait my best. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Greek, Greek, say steak. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Would be like one of my best friends. But um, I never, when I came, when we came to Sunset, I never thought that I would find a friendship in Steve. Um, and he's been a friend, and I'm very thankful for you. Um, and Jason, I just can't even. So there goes that part. Because um, I will cry. But I just want you to know that today, I told Steve this morning, Kelly's back. She's Amen. back. She hasn't been here in a year. So I'm extremely thankful that Thank I'm here. You. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> well, I think there was a reason God put that on my heart this morning. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, Frank Fender sent, says, Good morning. Being able to watch... Uh, and listen to the message during these times has been a blessing. Thank you to all that make this happen. Frank and Pat, Pat, we love you, and we're praying for you. Thank you for sending that message. All right, let's go to Lord and pray together. Heavenly Father, what a, what a blessing it's been to be able to share uh, together today. We are a family, a family that gathers at Daddy's feet every Sunday morning. And we come, Father, to worship you, but we also come because we have been richly blessed by you. The greatest blessing of all was the salvation we've received in Jesus. And Father, my prayer today is that we will be able to lift him up as we worship. Father, we thank you that, that Ann and Shirley and Warren and Audrey have joined our church today. What a blessing it is to be able to welcome them to the family and to know that uh, we're going to be able to, to share together and grow together in you every day. Father, we do, we do lift up all the, the burdens that are, in this, that are on our hearts this morning. We're still living in difficult times, Father, but we claim today with power and strength, you are in control, and we love you. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Bring your doubts and bring your fears. Bring your hurt and bring your tears. There'll be no condemnation here. Oh, you are holy, righteous, and redeemed. And every time I fall, there'll be those who will call me a mistake. Well, that's okay. Cause I hear a voice and he calls me redeemed When others say I'll never be enough And greater is the one living inside of me Than he who is living in the world In the world He's greater, he's greater. Every day I lose the battle, grace says it doesn't matter, cause the cross already won the war. He's greater, he's greater. I'm learning to run freely, understanding how he sees me and makes me love him more and more. He's greater, he's greater. Every day I lose the battle, grace says it doesn't matter, cause the cross already won the war. He's greater, he's greater. Cause I hear a voice and he calls me redeemed When others say I'll never be enough And greater is the one living inside of me Than he who is living in the world In the world In the world And greater is the one living inside of me than he who is living in the world. The battle break says that it doesn't matter cause the cross already won the war. He's greater, he's greater. I'm learning to run freely, understanding how he sees me and he makes me love him more and more. He's greater, he's greater. All right, we got a quiz coming up now. See how much you know about the Bible. Which of these New Testament churches is different from the others? Okay, Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Colossae, Thessalonica, Philippi. Which is different? Good guess, but wrong. The answer is, Paul did not establish the church in Rome. All the other churches I mentioned were given birth by Paul. And here's the thing. Even though many, many things that went, that went on in those churches drove Paul crazy, he loved each of them with a passion and an intensity of a devoted parent. But unlike good parents of, you know, two or more children, Paul never made any bones about it. He never tried to hide the fact that he was especially fond of the church at Philippi. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. Philippians 1, 3 through 8. Listen to what God's Word says here. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, we don't know exactly why Paul had these feelings about the church 
in Philippi. But by no, but but I mean by no means was the Philippian church the biggest or most most important congregation that Paul established. But you know sometimes the heart has its own reasons, doesn't it? And Paul's heart was deeply devoted to the Philippians. This morning we're going to discover how that love affair got started. If you still have your Bibles open, turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, we're going to pick up things this morning in the 13th verse. Acts 16, verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. You know, throughout this sermon series, I have I've talked about Paul's missionary strategy. It, did, it seemed it was always the same no matter where he went. The first Sabbath, following his arrival in a city, Paul would go and find the nearest synagogue where he would worship and inevitably be called upon to preach. Unfortunately, Philippi didn't have a congregation, which meant it was a thoroughly Gentile city. You see, the Old Testament law said that uh, a synagogue could be established any place where ten Jewish men lived. In other words, there weren't even 10 Jewish men living in the city of Philippi. But there were a few Jews living in that town, and they had another option. The law said that small groups of Jews, including women and children, could gather outdoors beside a body of worship, water for prayer and worship, which explains how Paul found Lydia and her friends. And by the way, if you don't think that Paul's experience on the Damascus Road changed him, think again. Paul was a trained rabbi, and as such, he would have thought that it was beneath his dignity to speak with a group of women. But Jesus had taught him that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This week I I was reading an article that that talked about uh, the ways some white evangelical churches uh, today still practice race, sexism, and and misogyny in their churches. These congregations and their male leaders try to suppress the women and girls in in their midst, robbing them of their dignity and preventing them from taking leadership roles in the church. But let me tell you something. As the husband, the father, the father-in-law, the grandfather, and the son of some strong women, all I can say is, why don't you pick up your Bible and read Galatians 3.28? The Bible isn't saying that all of our God-given differences are irrelevant in the church. They're gifts to be celebrated as believers. But we also have a new status that liberates us from our biases and prejudices. Now we are all one in Christ Jesus. All right, let's read on. Verse 14. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. Now, to say that Lydia was a worshiper of God meant that she was not born a Jew. She was also a Gentile, but she was a God-fearer. Someone who believed that the God of Israel was the one true and living God. Someone who believed that through the Old Te- what we know as the Old Testament, God had revealed himself to humanity. Now, because Lydia already loved God, she would have been very interested in the message that Paul was proclaiming. Notice what it says in the rest of verse 14. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Can you imagine how fantastic Paul's preaching, the proclamation of the good news, must have sounded to Lydia? Even though she already loved and worshipped God, she'd been taught that because of who she was, a Gentile and a woman, she could never be a full participating part of the family of God. But notice what Paul, Paul came along, and he was telling her something different. He said, 
Lydia, God loves you. He wants you to be a member of his family. He sent Jesus, his own son, to die for you on the cross. And if you ask Jesus to forgive your sin, of you of your sin and invite him to be your personal savior, you will be saved, you will be signed, sealed, and delivered as a member of God's family. Man, that was the most wonderful news Lydia had ever heard in her life. And the Holy Spirit led her to receive it with joy and thanksgiving. Verse 15. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to stay in her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. From that day forward, Lydia became one of Paul's closest friends and helpers in his ministry. You know, some people have even gone so far as to, is to, is to suggest that Paul and Lydia might have gotten married. But that would be speculation without a shred of biblical evidence. All we know for sure is that Lydia became one of the most important members of the church in Philippi. And her home became the center of Christian worship in that city. Okay, let's go on and read verse 16. What happens next? Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit. The Greek uh, word, the Greek expression here is Numa Pythona, by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. This woman was possessed of a spirit. In this case, it was called the spirit of the python. Now, to understand all this stuff, you have to go back to, to, to some Greek mythology. So, so roll your minds back to your, your English literature years and years and years ago. Okay. In Greek mythology, the python was the powerful serpent that guarded the temple of Apollo. The myths said that a person who was possessed by the python had the ability to tell the future. So the people in Philippi had come to believe that this woman was possessed of a spirit that would allow her to tell them what the future held in store. But the Word of God makes it clear that was not the case. In fact, she was what is called a demoniac. She was someone who was possessed by the by satan by the demons verse 17 goes on to say she followed paul and the rest of us shouting these men are servants of the most high god who are telling you the way to be saved and by the way she wasn't like john the baptist who was pointed at jesus and said behold the lamb of god that takes away the sin of the world you see the funny thing is in in the scripture is that any time the demons are pres are presented with the truth of god they always recognize it have you ever noticed that? They may be peddling lies, but, but they know they're telling lies because they rec always recognize the truth of God. You remember in, in Luke chapter 4, uh, something happens with Jesus, and it, it's recorded in, in verses 31 through 37. It says, Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught his, the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. We're talking about Jesus here. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away, what do you want to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly, come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down from before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What words these are? With authority and power, he gives order to impure spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. You know, sometimes, I don't know what it is, but sometimes Christians give Satan way too much credit. They seem to think that Satan is as powerful as God is. That he has the ability to torment their lives and destroy their relationship with Christ. Well, that's what his goal is, but he doesn't have the power to do it. You see, the truth is, Satan may be more powerful than you are, but when confronted with the power and majesty of the Almighty God, Satan always shrinks away like the coward that he is. Let me remind you what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. The, 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 the team was singing about it a few moments ago. 
You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Look, if you've been feeling a little defeated lately, you need, you need this. everybody needs to say this with me right now. Great, listen to it. Greater is the Spirit of God within me than the one who is in the world. Okay? Let's say it together. Greater is the Spirit of God within me than the one who is in the world. Let's say it again. Greater is the Spirit of God within me than the one who is in the world. Man, if you only remember one thing from today's sermon, take that with you, okay? All right, let's read on. Verse 18. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. Even though this slave girl had been proclaiming the truth, these men are here to tell you about how to be saved, Paul realized that Satan was destroying her life. And it broke his heart. So Paul cast out the demon in the name of Jesus. See, Paul understood the, the, the power of the name of Jesus. Jesus was God in human flesh. And nothing in heaven on, or on earth can defeat the name of Jesus. Remember, the day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that what? Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Years later, Paul reminded the Philippians of this truth when he wrote these words in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow, that's good stuff. But let me make one other comment before we move on. It's safe to assume that this slave girl probably eventually became a Christian. And, and can you imagine the testimony that she would have shared? She understood the love and the freedom that you find at the foot of the cross, and she wanted everyone to know about Jesus. In any case, one thing was absolutely certain. Her days of fortune-telling were over. Read on in verse 19. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, do you see the contrast between, between Paul's attitude and the attitude of this girl's owners? Paul saw her as a person of worth for whom Jesus died. He knew that she was valuable to God. And he wanted her to experience God's, the joy of God's love and the grace that only he can provide. Her owners, on the other hand, had no interest in this girl as a human being. She was their cash, cash cow. Nothing more and nothing less. So notice what happens in verse 19. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews. Oh, by the way, this is a blatant attempt to appeal to the anti-Semitism that most of these people possess. These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Here's something you may not know. Did you know that the early Christians were often accused of being atheists? Now, I know that sounds strange, but it happens to be true. See, Christians refused to acknowledge the gods and goddesses of Roman and Greek mythology. So in the minds of many, these people were atheists. This was the charge that this slave girl's owners were lodging at Paul and Silas. These men are disturbing the peace. They're turning the world upside down. They are preaching and teaching an illegal religion. You know, it's kind of funny. Some Christians think that when you submit to God's will for your life, that God is obligated to guarantee that you'll have a pain-free, no worries kind of life. Now, I don't know where, that come, what they, where they get that thought from, but I can tell you one thing. 
It did not come from God's perfect word. God's word makes it clear that suffering and hardship and difficulty will be a way of life for us in this world. Jesus even told his disciples that they could expect to be attacked and persecuted for their faith in him. Paul understood his suffering to be a badge of honor, a symbol that he had an unyielding faith in Jesus Christ. I want us to read a long passage of Scripture here. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to pick up with verse 23, and we're going to read all the way down to chapter 2, verse 9, because here Paul talks about some of the things that he endured as a Christian, as a proclaimer of Jesus. Listen to what he says here. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more aggressively, severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and a, a, a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have gone, often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Man, it, after all this, I think I'd give up. What about you? Besides everything else, I face the daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is be, to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor uh, under King Aertus had the city of Dam the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hand. I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ, he's talking about himself, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would be, not be a fool because I would be spread speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in the, my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. Here's the truth, folks. When you can write something like Paul just wrote, you are either a masochist or you are a 100% sold out for the Lord Jesus Christ Christian. Look. No matter what happened in his life, Paul was a man on fire. He loved Jesus with all his heart and with all his mind and with all his spirit. And he was willing to endure anything for the cause of Christ. So what did that, all did that lead Paul to in Philippi? Led him into, he got thrown in prison. That's what happened. Look at what it says in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. All right, I know, few of, I know a few of you at least know what a PCA is in medical terms. It's a machine that automatically dispenses pain medicine through an IV line. Doctors will frequently uh, prescribe a PCA for a patient who, has, who is experiencing intense pain, especially after surgery. Let me tell you something. That night, Paul and Silas could have used a PCA 
Notice what the Bible says. It says that they've been severely flogged. Uh, to put that in layman's terms, that meant that Paul and Silas had been beaten within an inch of their life. As a result of that beating, they were in excruciating pain. Add to that the thick, rusty chains around your ankles and, 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 and hands and a cold, dark dungeon that was probably filled with rats and roaches. And let's just put it this way. Paul and Silas should have been as miserable and depressed as two human beings can get. But what did they do instead? They were in that prison at midnight singing and praising the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9, Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have heard, have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Paul and Silas were two men who not only talked the talk, they walked the walk. They never let difficult circumstances determine the, the, their relationship, what their relationship with God was going to be like. Instead, every day they, they rejoiced in the transcendent power of God that they had received in Jesus Christ. Verse 26. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. What was this? It was a miracle. No doubt about it. I mean, think about it. One minute, you're locked away in a kind of hell on earth. And then... God gives you a get-out-of-jail-free card. The prison doors are flung open. Your chains are removed. And all you have to do is stand up and walk out. But nobody moved. The jailer woke up. And when he saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. You know, at that moment, suicide must have seemed like a good option to this jailer. He knew that if his prisoners had escaped, he would pray for, pay for it with his own life. Only after receiving a severe beating. I guess he decided that it would be better to die on your own terms than to be executed by the many gruesome ways that Romans killed their prisoners. Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Every prisoner was exactly where he was supposed to be. They were all mesmerized by the message of salvation that Paul and Silas were preaching. God loves me. Jesus died for me. I can be saved by calling on the name of Jesus. I'm not going to leave. I want to know how to be saved right here and now. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Have you ever thought about why this man asked this question? How would he even know to, act, to, to say something like this? How can I be saved? This was not a Jew or a God-fearing Gentile. Nothing in his background would have caused this man to think that he needed to be saved. Oh, granted, he may have heard the slave girl cry out, these men are telling you the way to be saved, but, but that wouldn't have meant anything to him. Her words would have been gibberish. It's possible he, you know, as, as Paul and Silas were preaching and singing in there in the jail cell, he'd been listening to what they were saying, and, but, but the, the chances are he wasn't even paying attention. 
In any event, he wouldn't have been interested in anything a Jew had to say. Now, obviously, the events, especially the earthquake, had gotten this man's attention. In the immortal words of Elvis, he was all shook up. But once he realized that his prisoners were all accounted for, that should have been enough. What must I do to be saved? The Holy Spirit put these words in that man's life, mouth. In a moment of crisis, the Spirit had caused him to ask the question that every human being must eventually ask. What must I do to be saved? Verse 31. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. You know, most of the time when Paul spoke to a Jewish congregation, he would begin by proving that from the Scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah, that He was the Christ, that He was the Son of the living God. But this time, Paul didn't bother making a case from Old Testament Scripture. I mean, that wouldn't have meant anything to this Roman jailer. Instead, Paul cut right to the chase. He told him the main thing he needed to know. If you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. It wasn't that all the rest of the stuff was unimportant. It wasn't. It was very important. But this was critical. Time was of the essence. If you want to be saved, you must believe in Jesus. And, you know, just, just a word here for those of you who already know Jesus is their Savior. If you ever encounter someone who is in the midst of a crisis, and they ask you, how do I be saved? You tell them what Paul and Silas told this man. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. I want you to listen to what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning the faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Let's go to Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning of worship today. We thank you for all the things that have already happened. And Father, we come now to the time when Perhaps someone here in the congregation or perhaps someone who is watching is sitting there saying, you know what, I need to ask myself the same question that Roman jailer asked himself. What do I need to do to be saved? And today, that message has been proclaimed. And I pray, Father, that if there's anyone who's ready to believe on the name of Jesus Christ and be saved, that they'll pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are God's one and only Son. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. Jesus, I believe that three days later, God physically raised you from the dead. Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner, that I've done things that I shouldn't have done in my life. But today, I want to ask you to come into my life and be my Savior and forever friend. Father, if someone has prayed this prayer, if they're here in the congregation, I pray that they'll, they'll see me come to the front after service is over and talk to me about this. If there's someone who's watching at home, I pray that they will, they'll send me a text or an email at the, at the address that's shown. Father, if there's someone here today who is ready to move their membership here, like, like the, the, like the ladies have done earlier, then I pray, Father, that they will they'll come forward after the service and tell me, you know, Steve, I'm ready to join. I, or, or, perhaps they, or perhaps it's someone at home that wants to say, I, I want to become a part of this church family too. And when, I, when things are better, I'll get back and be here. And Father, there may be others who, who, simp, who are already saved, who know Jesus as their Savior, and who've been listening today and realize that, you know, I need to live 
more powerfully. I need to live more joyfully. I need to live more blessed. So I'm le- I want Jesus to just take over and take control in my life so that I know that he's with me every step of the way. Father, whatever decisions need to be made, I pray they'll be made. I pray that you will be glorified in everything. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And then join us in singing, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. that you were here in God's house today or that you joined us uh, online. We're thankful that we've been able to worship together this morning. Um, one, one thing I want to ask you before we go. All right. How many of you are rooting for the Chiefs tonight? How many of you are rooting for the Buccaneers? A few of you are. Okay. We got some people on both sides of the aisle. Um, I, I, will, I will not let my know. Yes, I will. I'm, I'm pulling for the the Chiefs. I like, I like Patrick Mahomes a lot. But anyway, have a good time tonight as you're watching the game. Be safe, uh, whatever you do. As we get ready to go this morning, God's Word tells us in the book of Romans, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He also called 
Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Let's sing they'll know we're Christians by our love. God bless you. Wave to people as you go out. Have a good week.